Kelly Brownell, and I'm the Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. Prior to that, I was at Yale University for 23 years, and during a lot of that time I ran Center for Food Policy. All right. And I know you've done a lot of work on food addictions, and some of the topics that are covered in this class on eating disorders are things like anorexia and bulimia. Um, can you talk about possibly a link between food addiction and things like what people generally think about when they when they think of food, think of eating disorders? Well, the work on food addiction, which is coming more and more into the whole public discussion about obesity, hasn't really been discussed too much in the eating disorders field, but I think will be. And how it might apply would be this, that if people are, uh, if their brains are being hijacked by certain foods, like let's just say foods high in sugar, that's what's been studied the most, then it becomes harder and harder to maintain a healthy diet reasonable eating patterns and a healthy weight. So that puts a larger percentage of the population at war with their bodies, if you will, because their brains are driving them to do one thing, but they don't want to be at a heavier weight. And so some people succumb to the, the dietary inducements that are in the environment and become overweight. Other people might prevail over, but eating disorders is the unhealthy way of prevailing. So it's a really very interesting issue, and I think this topic of food and addiction will become more and more prominent in both the obesity and eating disorders fields. Right. And then another interesting link, I, I think, is the link between um, alcohol and obesity, uh, and then sort of the the addictive, the addictive link to alcohol, and, but then in a way it's sort of a food as well, there are calories involved. Um, can you talk a little about that? Well, alcohol well? is interesting. There, are, There's some work in the obesity field that shows an inverse relationship between alcohol consumption and risk for obesity. So you tend not to find many alcoholics who are overweight. There are some, but not as many who are at lower body weights. And so one of the hypotheses is that alcohol and food are competing for the same reward pathways in the brain. So that if you're consuming a lot of one substance, you wouldn't necessarily need the other. But that's, there's not a lot of research on this yet, and people are just speculating at this point. But it will be interesting to see where that goes. All right. Foods manufactured to make us high. Mark, the, my, my co-presenter at this conference, Mark Gold, mentioned that, and Bob DuPont, the former drug czar of the U.S., mentioned that as well, that these, these foods are manufactured to make us want more and more and more. That's what the companies are in business to do. They want to maximize sales of their products. But when it gets to the point that you're thwarting the body's normal biology, and you're eating beyond the point you're feeling full, or you start eating when you're not really biologically hungry, then there are problems and you have public health consequences from that. So I believe as we go forward in time, the companies will be held accountable for the intentional manipulation of ingredients that create cause, they, they cause public health harm. And that could end up in the courts somewhere, or could go some interesting places, but I expect that that will become more and more part of the public discourse as we go forward. And then that brings us to the discussion of strategic science, as you call it, which is sort of taking um, what we know and what we're learning in the labs and in the clinical arena and trying to make an impact in public policy. Um, talk about how important that is. Universities are unique in the world in that there are all these people with many disciplinary interests, points of view, areas of expertise, etc. And so it's, it would be really nice if the, the uh, knowledge that gets produced in universities has the, the maximal impact on the world. But it doesn't often happen that way because we as academics think we're in the business of creating knowledge, not creating impact from the knowledge. And if you go into it thinking that I want to do work that makes a difference, not just in my own field where a few other people who care about what I do are paying attention to it, but out there into the world of policy, it, it leads us down some different roads in terms of what kind of studies we decide to do, what kind of legal analyses we do, etc. And I think that's not the only thing a university should do, but it would be nice if we did more of it because then we'd create more good in the world because the work wouldn't stay confined within the university but have an impact out there on the people who are writing laws, making judicial decisions, etc. And would you call this sort of advocacy science or, or no? Not uh, necessarily. Yeah. Um, universities don't generally fancy, fancy, they don't use fancy themselves as being involved in advocacy. In fact, some places you're absolutely not supposed to do that. 
But that's different than just imparting knowledge. So my point of view is that legislators will make better decisions if they're informed. And one way of informing them isn't criticizing them for not paying attention to the wonderful work we do. It's making sure we do work that's relevant to them. And then hopefully more informed decisions. And, you know, the legislators will do what they wish. They have constituents that they have to report back to, and so it gets complicated. But it's very important, I think, that people, including legislators, be informed, and that's something we can do very well. All right. And then just one takeaway for the undergraduate students at this level, what do they need to start thinking about and doing um, at this level where they are? Follow your passion. Mm -hmm. You know, think about what you really get excited about in life. Uh, think, you know, think you have years and years of work experience ahead of you, so you want to do something that you're really turned on by. And so being passionate about what you do and thinking about how you can make a difference in the world will just lead to a whole set of career decisions that I think will lead people down a good road. Oh, thank you so much. My pleasure.